Hello everyone, it's John Pushkar. I'm here today with another episode to bring you important safety insights in the world of fuels and combustion systems. Today's episode is all about that worst day. It's about having an emergency plan that's robust enough to consider actually shutting fuels and natural gas systems off. Sounds simple, right? You go to a valve, you close it. So part of the issues that I want to address with you are, well, just where are those valves? Are they accessible? Are they in the places that they need to be? Are they actually functional? Has anybody been servicing them at all? I want to prepare you with some simple concepts and real life practical things you could do immediately after this video to go make sure that you and your site are prepared. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. So just how do you start such an evaluation, such an assessment? Well, it makes sense to start where the gas first comes into the facility. And although this might appear to be somewhat simple and somewhat intuitive, one of the things you have to determine is where the official line of demarcation is between what you own and what the utility owns. Sometimes it's not all that obvious. It's usually the discharge flange of the meter but they could also own a downstream manual isolation valve. NFPA 54, the National Fuel Gas Code, says that each customer must also own their own manual isolation valve. You need to find out which one is yours, verify that with the utility, and then you need to take a few simple steps to make sure that it's actually usable for you. One of them is, is, is there a handle? Another is, is it functional or is it actually seized in position? You'd be surprised at the number of these valves that I find in the field that haven't been moved or exercised in a gazillion years and they're not going to move when you need them to. Now you can't walk up to it and cycle it and shut down fuel for your facility. Instead you need to do some very careful planning where you could have someone actually go out there at a time when there's no production or no gas use in the facility and attempt to at least move it, maybe cycle it halfway so that you know that it indeed is functional. Is it a lubricated plug valve? Do you actually even know what kind of style of valve that is? If it is, then it needs regular sealant installation and cycling. This is given in manufacturer's instructions and is also something that I talk about in our module four of the Prussian Technical Services Online School. You should have marked this valve. Some people paint them red. Some people hang signs on them so it's easier for a fire department or emergency responder to identify which of possibly many valves are the ones to shut off in the case of an emergency. Is there fencing around this particular valve and the pressure reducing station that might be there? Is it accessible to the public so you've restricted access? If so, is there signage on that fencing which identifies who the key holder is? So this again is the start of the evaluation. Now you have to follow that gas line inside the facility. NFPA 54 also says there should be a manual isolation valve somewhere outside of a building. If you have manual isolation valves associated with the mains and the distribution systems inside or outside a building, are they accessible or are they 20 feet in the air? Are there chain operators or gear operators that haven't been serviced, that frankly don't work? Now is the time to find out about those things, not when you really need them. So we've now talked about two parts of this. We've talked about where the gas comes into the facility in general. We've now talked about where the gas might go into buildings and be associated with buildings. But there's two more parts to this. One is, is that NFPA 86, the standard for ovens and furnaces, well, it says that you need a remote manual isolation valve that's designated to be the valve that people would go to 
In the case of a real serious problem where you had to get fuel shut off to a particular oven or furnace and you couldn't be close enough to it, or that would be an extreme hazard. Do you have such valves? Are they identified? Do your people know about them? The other part of this is, is that every one of the specific equipment codes, NFPA 85, 86, 87, they all talk about having manual isolation valves at fuel trains. So again, the questions you have to ask about all of these valves, are there handles? Are they functional or are they seized in position? If they're lubricated plug valves, have they been serviced? Are they marked? At some point, you also have to identify whether or not they actually can do the job of isolation or do they leak through in the closed position? And if so, how bad and what might you want to do about that? I hope this helps. There are a number of modules at our Prussian Technical Services Online School that relate to this topic. One of them is the valves module, the piping module, and the gas distribution module so that you understand how gas actually gets to your facility and the paths that it takes. I'm going to show you an excerpt here out of the valves module, which I think will be helpful. At the end of the day, you need to be prepared to be able to shut off gas to your facility in case that really bad day occurs. Because at the end of the day, the life you save, it just might be yours. Let's next take a look at manual isolation valve issues, and we'll be covering just a couple of the most popular types, again, primarily associated with fuel trains, fuel systems, and a little bit into the steam world. In the fuel train and fuel system world, you'll primarily encounter plug valves and ball valves. We're going to start off talking about plug valves. There's two primary types of plug valves. There's lubricated plug valves and non-lubricated plug valves. Non-lubricated plug valves typically have some type of resilient seal that actually mates with the plug and touches it. Lubricated plug valves has, have no such seal internally. They rely on a sealant that gets injected down through the top in what's called a button head fitting. This sealant material has to find its way around all of the surfaces of the plug on top of the plug and under the plug and I'll show you how that happens. There's actually an air gap between the plug and the body on lubricated plug valves and it's only the sealant that makes the valve function as an isolation valve. I will tell you that Lubricated plug valves are probably 50% or more of fuel shutoff valves that you'll encounter in the field. One of the reasons is, is that they're infinitely serviceable and they're not impacted greatly by a little bit of dirt or crud in the system. You can continually add sealant and it's very difficult to have one of these fail unless the sealant hasn't been refreshed in quite some time. I will tell you that the two primary modes of failure that I've encountered in the field many, many times are that these valves leak when they're in the closed position, primarily because I've found a preponderance of people that own them don't understand that they require regular annual maintenance. The second mode of failure that's most popular is they seize in position and become very, very difficult to move if you can move them at all. Again, for the same reasons. Who says that these have to be regularly sealed? Well, the manufacturers of these valves give that kind of guidance and also some of the codes and standards like NFPA 86, the standard for ovens and furnaces, requires that the sealant in these valves be refreshed on an annual basis. If your facility does not own a sealant injection gun, I'm showing you one on the left hand side. If you're not familiar with this technology, uh, something you're seeing for the first time, chances are you're in that category of people who is not properly maintaining their lubricated plug valves. And please understand this is not grease. This is not axle grease for a car. 
That's why I'm careful to call it sealant. I never want to confuse people. There's specific types of sealant for specific valves and applications. It's a high pressure installation. You need to have a sealant injection gun. There's a number of different styles. I'm showing you one here on the left. But you want to make sure that whatever you have comes with some type of a gauge because it's only with this gauge that you would understand when the valve's accepting sealant properly and when you've installed all of the sealant that that valve could possibly accept. You don't want to be into a situation where you're installing sealant, it's bypassing the plug and filling the pipe. I'm showing you on the left this button head fitting and when they're sealed properly you can take a little screwdriver and push the little ball check down and you should have some sealant come out under pressure. I'm showing you on the right hand side how the sealant goes down through the button head fitting in the, the orange type color there. And there are grooves and channels meant to allow the sealant to flow to specific places in the plug and on the plug. It has to get under the plug, on top of the plug, and around the entire face of the plug. Here's a gentleman that's installing sealant and every few pumps of the handle he takes the plug and he rotates it to spread the sealant around the entire face of the plug. There's a YouTube video link that I've provided there. This provides great information for how to properly install sealant. It also provides methods to determine what's happening with the plug, which is very important to understand that you've done this job correctly. Again, sometimes these valves seize in position. Sometimes it's an external thing. On the left-hand side here, I'm showing you someone's painted over this valve probably for the last 20 years, and it's been in that open position for the last 20 years. I find that when this occurs, these valves need to be taken out of service. You need to find the closest upstream valve, uh, close that. You may have to purge the piping system using, of course, proper purging techniques, and you might need to replace that valve. In other cases, if it's because of internal seizing of the plug, there are solvents that you could buy to inject into the plug, and over time, like several days, and sometimes with a little external heat, not with a live flame, you can soften up that sealant, the solvent can do its work, and you can get them to move. Sometimes it's a corrosion issue. Sometimes it's a button head fitting issue. Button head fittings can be replaced for corrosion. Lots of penetrating oil and lots of patience can sometimes do the trick. A word of caution about plug valves and any valves that you have installed where the handles can be removed. Quite often they can be replaced in any position. So don't ever trust valve handle position as an indication of whether or not the valves open or closed. You can see on this plug valve style, and this feature is provided on many styles of valves, there's two raised bumps on the four corners of the square fitting there that's on top of the valve, and those two bumps are in alignment with the hole in the plug. So you can trust that, but you can't trust the handle position. Something else that would require regular attention in the valve world are gear operators on valves. Now, fuel system valves are supposed to be a quarter turn open to close. That's in NFPA 54, the National Fuel Gas Code. You'll notice that some operators having a, a wheel like is shown in the picture may take many turns, but the actual ball or plug in the valve body is only moving a quarter turn. These are there for mechanical advantage, typically on larger diameter valves, which require quite a bit of force to move. These also usually have some type of a, a spot to install a lubricant now and then. It's not a sealant. It is grease, and again, it has to be matched to the specific gears and the manufacturer's requirements of the gear operator but it's simply to make the gears work better. It doesn't do any sealing. 
Okay, so that's a little bit of information about the plug valve world. Let's next take a good hard look at the ball valve world. So ball valves have a few more moving parts. There's some type of a polished ball that's in the center of the valve. Got a, a hole in the middle of it. There's a seats on both sides. There's the body of the valve. There's a stem, a handle, some packing material. And generally they're recognized as two different types, a floating ball assembly or a mounted fixed ball assembly sometimes called a trunnion mounted ball valve. So let's discuss the differences in these two and how to recognize them. In the floating ball type of ball valve, the ball itself can move against seats that are fixed. So there's a slight amount of movement, pressure times area is force. So when the ball's closed, you get that pressure times the area of the ball and it pushes it against the seat to make it closed. The ball can move just a slight amount again to gain that seal. Fixed or trunnion mounted ball valves keep that ball in one location and it's the seals that actually move a slight amount to create the sealing capability of the valve. These are relatively larger style ball valves and you may see something that looks like grease fittings on there or sealant injection fittings. If you take a good close-up look at what those tags say, they say that they're for emergency sealing only. There is no regular requirement to refresh these. There's a special material which you should have on hand and a special tool. In case, for example, you're trying to do a maintenance outage, you close the valve and it still leaks it would give you the opportunity to get that sealing effect. The other thing that's shown is uh, kind of tough to see, but the center arrow there, right hand lower picture, is actually showing you a bleed port. There are trunnion mounted ball valves that are available as double block and bleed assemblies. You can actually open the vent port and use it as a double block and bleed. You can route that to a safe place if you need to, but that allows you to monitor possible leakage through the first set of seals. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level, things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment, and even being a legal expert if things go really wrong. Once again, thank you for attending, and remember, be safe out there, the life you save, it just might be yours.